Where did DOS come from? Why does DOS look the way that it does? And why are people still using DOS in 2020? So I just gave this talk at a conference and I wanted to share a version of that here. And it's really about sort of the history of computing, a little bit of the history of computing, uh, the origins and development of uh, DOS and where FreeDOS started and where FreeDOS is going. So join me for a talk here about why DOS was and is a thing. Uh, so if I'm going to start talking about DOS, I actually want to jump back even a little bit further and talk about the first version of Unix. This is uh, uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie seated at a, a PDP-11, uh, which is one of the first systems that ran uh, Unix at uh, Bell Labs. I'm not going to go into the full history of uh, Unix. For that, you can read Brian Kernahan's book, uh, Unix, A History and a Memoir. But, you know, I think the, the main takeaway uh, from that is that there was no grand design for what Unix uh, should be or what Unix should look like or what commands should appear in Unix. Uh, they developed Unix for what it was. Uh, a place to run programs, and then as they needed to have other programs and other commands on the command line, uh, they added them. Um, you know, there's there's great stories in that book about, uh, you know, adding the grep command, adding the awk command. My favorite story in there is about the nrof command. Um, and it all came from need. Somebody needed that program, and somebody wrote it or had already written it and just contributed it. And so there was no roadmap. There was no design that somebody said the next version of Unix will look like this. It just grew organically because people were uh, developing it kind of as they needed it to uh, have new features. And so that's kind of why Unix uh, looks the way that it does. But if you look ahead, uh, skip time ahead a little bit, uh, when computing became uh, less expensive, when those costs came down in the late mid to late 1970s, you started to see uh, what were called personal computers hitting the market. And so here you've got um, a, a Radio Shack a TRS-80 on the right-hand side, and that was a very popular system at the time, as, as was the Commodore. Um, and the Apple I was around at the time, and that was a, a home kit. You would, you would basically uh, assemble that at home. Uh, and the Apple II came along in the very late 70s, and that was, uh, that was something that really took over the computer market at the time, personal computer market at the time. Uh, you know, all of these systems, though, uh, they weren't designed for compatibility. That Nobody really expected that you were going to uh, be able to compile a program for the TRS-80 and then pick it up and then drop it onto the, uh, the Apple II and run it there. That kind of binary compatibility did not exist. Uh, there maybe was some source compatibility because the whole point uh, on those personal computers was to run a basic environment. And so maybe you could take a program that you'd written on the TRS-80 and uh, port it over to the Apple II. There were some real practical issues on doing that, but I guess maybe at a source code level, uh, BASIC was similar enough that you probably could run uh, a BASIC program written for one system and another. But on a practical sense, uh, there was never really any compatibility uh, planned for or designed into these different systems. Every system was its own system. And that reflected what was going on in the market as well. So all the big computer systems were incompatible with each other as well. Now, uh, these systems ran from floppy, uh, and they had a very poor command line. So the Apple II, for example, was one system I used, or I used a clone of it. Uh, it had a very poor command line. You didn't really have utilities. You, know, you, could, you could run a program from the command line. You could do a catalog to see uh, what was on a floppy. Uh, but there really wasn't a, a, a command line rich environment like you have on Unix. And nobody really expected one. You really, the, the operating systems at that time were really meant to bring the computer up, uh, be able to run programs on that platform, and be able to enter a basic environment. And so with that same design goals, you had IBM entering the market in 1981 with the original IBM PC. And so this is the original IBM PC from 1981. Uh, again, the goal here was we're going to, uh, they recognized the personal computer market was hot and people were buying personal computers, and so IBM wanted to get into that market. And there's a lot of really interesting backstory around uh, developing the IBM PC and uh, the short time frame that it was developed. 
Now, when they created the first IBM PC, uh, you know, IBM had the same design goals, as I said, that other personal computers had. They needed an operating system that's going to bring the computer up and let you run uh, programs. And they needed to have a basic environment as well. And they worked with, uh, eventually, Microsoft to create that first version uh, of their operating system, which is eventually called uh, PC-DOS. Now, where did PC-DOS come from? Well, there's other stories about, uh, you know, starting with 86-DOS and Seattle Computer, but really kind of starts with CPM, which, yeah, digital research, uh, that was that was not where DOS came from, but there were some uh, design elements from CPM that made it into MS-DOS. And as you can see here, this is a, a CPM 86 version one, which came out about a year later. You know, the command line is not very rich. You can see here, uh, it only has a handful of commands. Uh, you know, there's an editor, ed, um, there's a, a limited help system there. Uh, you have, uh, instead of a date and time command, you've got uh, just one uh, that's called Todd, and that will uh, that will set the date and time uh, and display the date and time. Uh, but you're not seeing a lot of commands in here that uh, kind of replicate what you're seeing in Unix with that very rich command line environment because nobody expected at the time that you were going to have a, uh, a command line rich environment on a personal computer. Uh, and so that's what they designed. They designed a, an operating system that was uh, kind of similar to that environment. So CPM was an early environment for those Intel machines and uh, DOS kind of borrowed some ideas from it. Although I will also add CPM itself borrowed from uh, other operating systems. In fact, I think it was the uh, operating system on the PDP-11, not the Unix system, but the actual operating system that came with that hardware. Uh, uh, CPM borrowed a couple of the concepts from that. Uh, now, the uh, the version that uh, that came out then for the um, that that uh, first IBM PC was PC DOS 1.0 from Microsoft. Uh, it was basically a cleanup version of Seattle's uh, uh, QDOS, which originally stood for a Quick and Dirty Operating System, although later it was just renamed uh, to DOS 86, and that was the disk operating system, and that's where uh, DOS got its real name. Not a lot of features in that first version of DOS. Um, as you can see here, I got a directory of, uh, of DOS 1.0. Uh, the second floppy, the B floppy, has a ton of uh, basic programs on it, so you can run in the basic environment. But uh, in terms of the commands themselves, the external commands, not a lot of external commands. Uh, stuff that's going to let you run your system, basically, and do some stuff with the floppy disks. Uh, there isn't even a CLS command at the top of the screen. You can see I've tried to run a CLS command. There's not even a CLS command in that version of DOS. The intention wasn't really to build an operating system that had a rich command line with that first version. Because again, the whole point at the time with personal computers was to have an operating system that brought the computer up and let you run programs and had a basic environment. And that's exactly what PC-DOS 1.0 delivered, was that ability to boot the IBM PC, run DOS applications, and have a basic environment that you could uh, type com uh, your own programs into. So... You know, if I were to kind of look at what DOS 1.0 looked like, DOS 1.0 uh, really was about getting that system up and running your programs and had that basic environment. So you can see command uh, was, that was the first time we had the command uh, com program. Uh, we have uh, versions of basic. And then the other commands you have in that first version of DOS, not really looking at uh, providing that rich command line experience that you get in, uh, in Unix. It's really about uh, sort of system tools, you know, format, disk comp, disk copy, uh, things like that, and, and file-based things like copy, erase, rename, and type. So you can do a little bit of viewing files, but not a lot of stuff going on there. Version 2 um, was the, uh, the first version to support subdirectories, and that was a major deal, a major deal for uh, DOS. Uh, so yeah, you've got the ability here to do uh, uh, make dir or md to make a directory. Uh, you can clean that directory up by doing a remdir or rd. Uh, you can go into a cd. Uh, now that you can put programs in different directories, you need the ability to uh, let command com find those. And so that's why you have a path command. And a tree command will let you look at the directories you've been creating and be able to uh, kind of see what's out there. There's also some other stuff in in, in PC DOS 2 about 
uh, batch processing. So you can see uh, you've got commands in this version that showed up uh, for the first time that uh, support batch. So you've got the ability to have a for loop in command com. You have the ability to jump around a batch file with uh, go to. You can do some limited uh, conditional uh, uh, execution using if. You can assign variables of different values using set. You can parse the command line in a limited way using shift. So yeah, you've got some batch processing being uh, finally added. You got a little bit of command line stuff being added. I mean, not a ton, but you are getting some things like find where you can look locate text in text files. Uh, you can view files now a page at a time using more. Uh, you can sort some text files using sort, compare them, things like that, but not looking to create that uh, or mimic that that rich command line experience that you had from Unix. It really was making a system focused around applications. The command line was really there to get you from application to application. You know, when DOS 3 came out, uh, it was really the first time that Microsoft was allowed to uh, market their own version of DOS. So even though they'd made the versions of DOS for the IBM PC up until that point as PC DOS, uh, this is the first time you had MS DOS hitting the scene. And, you know, that's where you, uh, you know, what I look at what, what they're doing with MS DOS 3 is they're really looking at providing compatibility. You know, one thing that Microsoft did really well is provide backwards compatibility to different versions of DOS. And so uh, you've got commands in here that are going to help you uh, do that, especially uh, join and subst. So if you've got programs that were written for DOS 1 that didn't uh, support uh, different directories, you could now uh, make it look like a uh, program was living in its own floppy disk, things like that. So, you know, the, uh, the ability to uh, support older versions of DOS is a, I think a major version, probably the the biggest version, uh, or the biggest feature in uh, in MS DOS uh, three when they released it. MS DOS four didn't have a lot of stuff in it. Um, you know there were some uh, under the scenes or under the hood uh, features uh, uh, being added and certainly uh, improved the system quite a bit. But in terms of um, what you could do with the command line, uh, really only added the mem command, so you can see what, how much memory is in your system, and true name. There's just not a lot going on. Now, another feature that they did add in 4, though, was the uh, original DOS shell. This is when you started to get a text-based uh, menu system, menu interface, to be able to run applications uh, running on DOS. It was still kind of primitive, but at least it, it uh, you know, Microsoft was recognizing that most people didn't want to live with the command line they were very happy to just let something uh, be selected off of a menu and run the program from there. DOS 5 for me was really where uh, DOS got a major overhaul, uh, major facelift. Uh, you know, that was the first time that Microsoft replaced, uh, replaced the Edlin command. You know, Edlin was a, a very simple uh, text editor. Uh, we have a version of that in, uh, in FreeDOS and it's outstanding, but... Um, uh, you know, Edlin, not a very friendly uh, editor to use. And so they replaced that with a new full screen editor called Edit. Now, Edit itself was really just a uh, the QBasic environment uh, running in editor mode. But QBasic itself was replacing the old basic system. So the old basic programs had to have, you know, line numbers and things like that. Uh, QBasic uh, didn't have to have line numbers. And in fact, uh, it was uh, QBasic was a cut down version of the quick basic compiler that Microsoft had made. It's basically uh, running as a, uh, a basic interpreter. Uh, so it's only running in interpreter mode. And so that was the major update there uh, for basic was replacing it with QBasic and then having that uh, QBasic uh, editor running in edit mode as the edit uh, command. And that was a uh, major update to DOS. It really felt like they'd uploaded or uh, updated a lot of stuff in DOS as well beyond that. And so you had uh, now a new help system, uh, a little primitive, but it was it was a pretty good help system. Uh, you had the ability to uh, uh, load a mouse driver uh, as opposed to uh, having one provided for you. And you had some other things with uh, memory because uh, systems at this point could get uh, more memory loaded. And so you had an EMM 3D6, so you could support 3D6 CPUs uh, and support that uh, that extra memory. Uh, you could uh, uh, 
load uh, programs and drivers and TSRs into specific uh, memory locations using uh, load fix or load high. Uh, and if you uh, used MS-DOS 5 at the time, you probably remember um, setting up your, your config sys and auto exec bat, um, uh, and tweaking the heck out of it uh, to get the most out of your memory. Now, uh, MS-DOS 5 also introduced a new uh, uh, DOS shell. So DOS 4 introduced a text-based version. MS-DOS 5 uh, DOS shell could still run in text mode, but uh, I ran it myself in graphics mode. It was actually a pretty good file manager. Uh, I really liked it. Um, and, you know, you can see there at the bottom, you could uh, have different programs entered into a menu, and so you could launch your programs that way. Uh, it also had a really neat feature uh, the MS-DOS shell where you could do alt tab to switch between, uh, running programs. It would pause, basically pause one and, and, and switch to another one. It was a very simple way to have multiple programs running at once. And certainly, uh, I wouldn't have one of those programs be a terminal emulator running your modem because, uh, it would probably hang up on you. But, um, you know, it was good enough uh, for me at the time to, uh, switch between, uh, a spreadsheet program and my word processor program. Just make sure you save your file before you switch, uh, just in case something goes wrong. Uh, but that was a really neat feature in uh, in DOS five. DOS six didn't add a lot as well. You can see, uh, you know, this is the first time we had the choice command, uh, the move command, um, you know, the ability to defrag your hard drive, uh, to delete an entire directory tree at once. So, um, you know, I think as you look at the history of DOS, DOS 1 through this DOS 6, you're not seeing an attempt to create a very rich command line experience. Uh, I don't think Microsoft was really looking to create uh, a new version of Unix, for example. It was really about, you know, how do we get the system to come up and run DOS programs and still have a basic environment? Because don't forget, uh, the original PC was created at a time when uh, that's all people are trying to do. They're trying to boot their computer uh, and run certain programs and have a basic environment. And that's what DOS was continuing to do. And DOS, by the way, had a lot of great applications, it had a lot of great killer applications, uh, what, we, what we call them today. And so uh, this is uh, VisiCalc, one of the uh, first spreadsheets. Actually, I would argue the first actual spreadsheet, interactive spreadsheet you're going to have on a computer. There were other spreadsheets before that. But this is the first time it really got uh, interactive and certainly the first time you could run a, uh, a spreadsheet on a personal computer. Originally it was for the Apple II, but uh, there was a version released as well for DOS. And it was a uh, very, very nice uh, spreadsheet. Uh, it was replaced by uh, Lotus 1-2-3. Uh, Lotus 1-2-3 uh, had uh, the same usage as, uh, as VisiCalc. It just did more. Uh, and you know, the, uh, as, if you look at VisiCalc, as you look at Lotus 123 and compare that to modern spreadsheets today, yeah, they look the same because Lotus 123 took away the market from VisiCalc because it basically made a version of VisiCalc that was better and it was compatible. And when, uh, Quattro Pro came along and took away the market from, uh, Lotus 123, they did it by making a compatible version, uh, spreadsheet that, uh, could read and write, uh, Lotus 123 files that, uh, the menu was the same, the functions were the same. And then when Excel came along, uh, they basically were, uh, mimicking the same style that you're seeing in Lotus 123 and Quattro Pro, except now it ran on windows. So, uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, these killer applications uh, running on DOS. And I would argue the spreadsheet was a pretty uh, amazing application. Of course, my favorite one, and you've seen this before, is uh, the As Easy As spreadsheet. It was a, a, a shareware spreadsheet at the time that was uh, something I used quite a lot. You also had word processors. Word processors were another huge uh, killer application on DOS. And so uh, this is uh, WordStar 4.0. Uh, you had a lot of different word processors that were very popular, but WordStar was one of the most popular at the time. Uh, I would argue only to really displaced by uh, WordPerfect. WordPerfect was everywhere. Uh, WordPerfect was, uh, was if you went into any company uh, in the late 80s, really actually in the early 1990s, uh, you were probably finding uh, uh, WordPerfect. Uh, everybody needed to have WordPerfect. So uh, WordPerfect and Lotus 1, 2, 3 kind of ran offices all 
over the world, really. Uh, but there were lots of other applications. Uh, and if you could think of it, uh, there was probably an application that did it, uh, including a ton of games. Doom was one of the most popular games of the time. And on this channel, you've seen me uh, run a bunch of games and obviously more games coming up. But uh, Doom was a very, very popular game of the time, as well as a ton of other games. You had a bunch of other games and some screenshots you're seeing on here. Uh, you've got in the upper right, you've got uh, uh, Star Wars Dark Forces. Uh, center bottom, you've got uh, Tomb Raider. And the upper left, you've got uh, the first uh, Commander Keen shareware game. Uh, where you are a little eight-year-old kid who builds a uh, rocket ship and you crash land on Mars. So, uh, yeah, a lot of great games, these and others, very, very popular running on DOS. Now, if if uh, DOS was so popular, if it had all these great applications and all of these uh, great games, then why, why would Microsoft stop doing DOS? Well, I, I would argue it kind of starts back in 1984. I, I won't spend a ton of time on this one, but, you know, in 1984... Uh, Apple changed the personal computing game and they released the Apple Macintosh. Apple Macintosh, uh, the most important uh, part about it is that it featured a graphical user interface. It ran in black and white mode. So as you can see here, it was only black and white. Uh, and that was mainly due to a limited amount of memory. It had about 128K uh, of memory at the time. But uh, this was uh, uh, really changing the, the personal computer game. Again, operating systems needed to uh, bring the computer up and let you run applications. And that's exactly what the uh, Apple Macintosh did. And it did it using a GUI. And so that meant it was very easy for new users to pick up. The next year after that, uh, Microsoft uh, tried to respond to the uh, uh, to the Apple Macintosh by talking about uh, Windows. And in fact, in, in 1985, Microsoft released uh, Windows 1.0, uh, which I would argue was uh, more of a test drive than a product. Uh, it was not very stable. Uh, it uh, it didn't even support overlapping windows. You couldn't get windows that could overlap each other. Uh, windows 2.0 made it more stable, but still not great. Uh, windows 3.0, even a couple years after that, uh, became much better. Um, and it wasn't really, I would argue, though, until 3.1, Windows 3.1 in the early 90s, that uh, you really had a version of Windows that people were willing to use at work. And so uh, the, uh, you know, Windows 3.1, um, you know, looked like this. And so you had, you know, it was not much different from what Windows 1 and Windows 2 looked like. Uh, but um, it, uh, it lets you interact with your system. It was, it was, it was kind of basic. I didn't like it um, because I thought it looked too simple, uh, too primitive. Uh, by this time, I'd been using Unix, which I guess didn't look that much different. But, um, you know, Windows was uh, very limiting. You couldn't you couldn't do a lot of things on it. That was my opinion. Uh, you can only do the things that the menus let you uh, do. And so by this time, I'd already written uh, started writing my own programs that, that ran on MS-DOS that uh, expanded the MS-DOS command line. And I didn't really have a need for uh, for Windows. You know, all my stuff could uh, run in DOS applications or uh, there were text files that I could manipulate myself uh, by uh, using programs that I'd written on my own. So uh, I had a pretty rich command line by this point. I didn't really have a need for Windows 3. Um, and of course, the other problem is in 1994, you started to see these articles showing up in technology magazines. Uh, you know, this one from uh, PC Format Magazine in July of 1994, uh, talking about the new version of Windows is coming out soon. Uh, it was codenamed Chicago, and that was the one that was released as Windows 95. And these articles basically talked about, yeah, the new version of Windows is going to completely replace DOS. Chicago replaces DOS completely. Other articles talked about how DOS is dead. Uh, yeah, Microsoft was at this point really going all in on Windows and they, they wanted to abandon uh, DOS. And so, uh, you know, even though there would be a version of DOS running under the hood under uh, Windows 95, it really wasn't about Windows anymore or DOS anymore. And so it was really about how can we run our computers entirely using Windows. Uh, I didn't think that was a great idea because as I said, I'd, I was using DOS at uh, the command line and DOS applications all the time. And so in 1994, uh, in June 29, I made an announcement on uh, a message board at the time called uh, Usenet. 
announcing a uh, the, what would become the FreeDOS project. Now, at the time, I called it public domain DOS uh, because I didn't quite understand what public domain meant. Uh, at the time, I kind of thought that uh, public domain uh, meant free software, so I was making it available to the public. Um, but really, we very quickly realized uh, that uh, we were really trying to create a free software version of DOS. And so we very quickly renamed uh, PDDOS to FreeDOS. So that's where FreeDOS came from. In 1994, this little announcement about creating our own version of DOS. Microsoft is going to reject DOS, and I wanted to uh, start working on my own version of DOS. So, you know, the first couple of years of, of FreeDOS, we moved kind of slowly which is fine. Um, you know, we had uh, alpha releases from uh, 1994 through the end of 1997. Uh, and you can see the name change there from free DOS with a hyphen to without. Uh, and in uh, uh, starting in 1998, we had our first beta release. And so the difference between beta and alpha, uh, I would say really was we added a, an install program for the first time. Before that, in the alpha versions, you had a uh, software uh, uh, set that you could install, and it came as really big zip disks or zip files. And uh, there was another boot floppy that you would download that uh, you had some manual steps to do to, you know, F disk and format. Um, and then you'd have to unzip these, uh, these files onto your new hard drive. Uh, the FreeDOS Beta 1. 1998 was the first time that we actually had an install program. First version was kind of simple, uh, but we added uh, more features that made it easier to use, uh, made it a little snazzier after that. Um, and uh, and that's really what, what gave us the beta version. And then in uh, 2003, we started our slow crawl up to 1.0. Uh, so we had these release candidates in advance of the beta 9. And so we had beta 9 release candidate 1 all the way up through release candidate 4, uh, you know, over the process of about a year. And then we finally released uh, beta 9 uh, later that fall. Uh, and then from there, we, we were kind of happy with what we had. And so we, we had a service release uh, 1 and service release 2 uh, for beta 9 uh, over the next year there. And then uh, finally, in September of 2006, we finally released uh, FreeDOS 1.0, and that was that was a pretty major deal for the FreeDOS project to be able to have a version that uh, we felt ran MS DOS programs very very well with a high level of compatibility. Uh, you couldn't, I don't think at the time, really run like Windows, um, or if you could, you had to run it with the like a 286, uh, uh, so you couldn't. Um, uh, 286 switch so you couldn't uh, use some of the more advanced features of memory uh, but maybe it's not a surprise that you couldn't run windows on freedos at this point because uh, there's a lot going on in windows behind the hood and then you know it also uh, uh, could probably couldn't run like like qemm but you could run word processors uh, you could run uh, you know games spreadsheets basically you name it you could run it on freedos and that's really what made that 1.0 uh, so special. Now, uh, from there, we had uh, this is a screenshot of 1.2. You know, we really started to add a lot of uh, features. What made FreeDOS special was we added a lot of features to it, more than just trying to reproduce what MS DOS provided. Uh, with MS DOS 6, we wanted to make sure that we had a um, uh, rich uh, command line environment. So, you, you if you used FreeDOS at the time, you know that we had a very a uh, varied set of uh, commands. Uh, we had a very long list of commands in the util directory that was always growing. We definitely had compilers and assemblers so that people who wanted to write their own could do that. And so we provided a lot of different things uh, to make FreeDOS an environment for developers uh, as well as those who wanted to keep running uh, their older DOS programs. Uh, from 2006 to 2016, over that 10 year period, FreeDOS didn't move very quickly, and that's that's okay because DOS was not a moving target. Uh, DOS had stopped being a moving target in 1995, and so features didn't really need to get added, deleted. Uh, really, you know, looking at compatibility and fixing some bugs here and there. Um, and so, yeah, it it uh, you know it took us a while. It took us six years to go from uh, 1.0 to 1.1. .1. Uh, it took us another four years to go from 1.1 .1 to 1.2. 
and now we're planning the 1.3. So what is 1.3 going to look like? Uh, well, we're still looking at the uh, at the core version of what is DOS. The core question: What is DOS? DOS is a 16-bit operating system, and FreeDOS 1.3 will continue to be a 16-bit operating system. It'll be single tasking. It'll be single user. It'll run on a command line, and it'll support uh, older hardware. And I don't know that you can run FreeDOS uh, on on an XT, for example, but um, those systems, I think, are getting a little hard to come by. A lot of people will run uh, FreeDOS on uh, some class of a Pentium CPU. You get a couple people who run it maybe on a, on a 486 and maybe a 386. And once in a while, you'll see an AT out there. I think those, those older systems are getting much harder to find. Uh, so when we talk about older hardware, we're really talking about stuff that uh, was probably, let's say, around 2000, which, you know, it's 20 years old. Uh, but the great thing about it is compatibility is still key. People sometimes ask, why don't you add, uh, you know, these extra features and, uh, you know, support multitasking and, uh, you know, maybe change by doing so change the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the DOS uh, executable format. So that way you have all these different features, but that breaks compatibility. Uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I, if, if it's, if it's going to break compatibility, if, if uh, FreeDOS is no longer able to run older DOS programs, then it's not really FreeDOS anymore. And if it's not FreeDOS anymore, why would we want to keep working on it? So it has to have compatibility. Uh, and so really we're looking at what is a modern DOS. And so as we look at that, it's about the tools and it's about the utilities. And so we're having discussions on the mailing list about uh, what that uh, what that DOS looks like. Um, and so that's kind of where we are. That's where we are from where uh, DOS came from and its origins and its development and where FreeDOS came from in 1994 all the way up to today and a little bit of glimpse in what uh, FreeDOS 1.3 is going to look like. Uh, before I wrap up, I just want to say thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. You really do make this channel happen. And so thank you very much for your support. Some of you are sponsoring me at a higher level, and I want to thank you here. So thank you very much for that as well. Before I go, visit our website at freedos.org. Join us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you. <laughs>